Good morning, everyone. Thank you for giving me this opportunity this morning. Uh, in fact, it's not going to be stem cell, but gene therapy that I'll be uh, discussing this morning. Um, I think we um, have a sort of notion of how the failing myocardium um, has dysfunctional cardiac cells, fibroblasts that uh, are uh, expanding due to infarcts or uh, dead cells, um, and progenitor cells that can have the ability to um, induce proliferation of cardiac myocytes or have paracrine effects on them. Now, um, over the years, uh, there's been a lot of work on sorry, stem cell uh, to replace uh, the dead zones. Um, however, uh, gene therapy really concerns itself with how to improve uh, cardiac cell function uh, using our knowledge of what's wrong within the cardiac cell. So here's a, a schematic of uh, excitation contraction coupling um, in cardiac cells. And some of the areas that have been known to be abnormal in heart failure, including calcium cycling, uh, beta adrenergic uh, signaling, a uh, number of pathways uh, for hypertrophic responses. Uh, and a lot of work has been done on how to improve, uh, for example, calcium cycling, ryanodine receptor uh, dysfunction with leaks of uh, calcium from the SR and uh, circa uptake. Now, uh, for many years, uh, we had worked on how circa deficiency, which is the calcium transporting protein within the cardiac cell, is deficient in heart failure, and that deficiency comes from uh, regardless of the etiology of heart failure, and uh, it seemed to be an important target. Unfortunately, pharmacologically, it's been very hard to uh, go after this target, and for that reason, um, we undertook many years ago a gene therapy approach to uh, try and restore circa function. Uh, and in gene therapy, there are obviously a lot of uh, steps to take from choice of vectors, modes of delivery, uh, immune response, up to the clinical trials. Um, in terms of choosing the vectors, uh, there's a variety of them, uh, and it's really outside the scope of this talk, but uh, for heart failure, uh, one vector has emerged as being uh, very important, and that's uh, the adeno-associated vector. And namely because it's safe, it's non-pathogenic, it has a low immune response, it contains no viral gene, and in fact the first gene therapy uh, product, uh, Glybera, which is a replacement for LPL deficiency, uh, is based on an AAV vector. Um, and uh, you can see the size of the AV vector compared to an adenovirus. Here's an AV vector, and this is the adeno, so very small, and this allows it to navigate through coronary arteries and be injected. So over 10 years ago, we started uh, a gene therapy trial uh, called CUPID, where we delivered intracoronary uh, AV vector encoding for circa 2A and that was followed by a phase two double-blinded uh, trial. And th as I said, the, uh, the, the size of the vector was important to be able to navigate down the coronary arteries and infect cardiac cells, uh, and in that way, we could get uh, enhancement of uh, cardiac function. So you deliver the gene of interest uh, using these AV vectors, which are safe uh, or have been proven to be safe over uh, thousands of, in thousands of patients, cardiac and non-cardiac, uh, and the idea would be to be able to deliver these vectors uh, by intracoronary uh, injection. Now, uh, our trial, sorry, uh, showed uh, in the phase two that uh, if you take patients with uh, class three, class four heart failure, uh, you basically stabilize or improve symptomatic functional parameters. Um, and in fact, if you look at um, time to recurrent heart failure hospitalization, you basically have improvement over a three year period. Now, a larger trial, which was uh, 125 patients internationally in 50 international sites, 
uh, unfortunately did not show that, uh, even though there were some early signs that uh, uh, the curves were separating. But in fact, over time, uh, the probability of being terminally, terminally event-free uh, was not different between circa and placebo, and there were really no differences in the subgroup analysis. So um, we, we've come back to try to understand what is the problem with some of these, uh, uh, with the target or different uh, formulations, or whenever you're a biological agent, these are things that you think about, uptake of the vector, was there a T cell response, and of course the method of gene transfer. So uh, our target, circa 2A, has been validated by a you know, large number of investigators uh, over the years, and it seems that in cardiac and vascular bi biology, uh, restoring this function is, uh, has been shown beneficial in many cardiovascular systems. Uh, unfortunately, the uptake in, in the uh, clinical trials was quite low. These are the uptakes from patients at the time of VAD or cardiac transplant. And uh, you can see here, compared to animal models, which were the basis for the clinical trials, the uptake was very small, 3% uh, or less. So clearly, uh, there was an issue there. Uh, the T cell response, which can occur from presentation of the capsid to the circulation, uh, was not an issue because we didn't see a T cell response across uh, hundreds of patients who received uh, our vector. And the modes of delivery, even though it's not probably the best mode of delivery, um, was the safest, at least across the board, and that's where we should work uh, much more. So um, we are of next step for our program here where uh, we are increasing the doses of AV1 circa in an upcoming trial. Uh, we are also combining circa with other vectors, other genes, I mean, uh, here's one of our programs with circa 2A and CCN5. CCN5 reduces fibrosis, and by combining the two, we're enhancing contractility and decreasing fibrosis in this model uh, in the sheep of ischemic, in, ischemia-induced mitral regurgitation. Here's a trial with a, a higher dose, so we're going up to 10 to the 14, so 10 times higher than our original dose, which the FDA allowed us to do. Uh, later on this year, we will start another trial, which was on pulmonary hypertension, and this is for patients um, with type 1 pulmonary hypertension and inhaled uh, AV1 circa, which in uh, large animal models have been shown uh, to improve uh, both uh, pulmonary, ten pulmonary uh, arterial uh, pressures and also uh, the remodeling of uh, the arterioles, along with improved uh, RV function, because circuit 2A has a specific effect on inhibiting smooth muscle cell proliferation and uh, improving endothelial uh, cells function. Now, one of the Achilles heels for our, for our trials has been that uh, the distribution of neutralizing antibodies across the U.S. and Europe for our trial was really high, and neutralizing antibodies are um, antecedent antibodies that exist in all of us against specific uh, AV vectors. And uh, basically, um, m uh, most of uh, the U.S. and Europe had about 50 to 60 percent neutralizing antibodies in patients, which uh, precludes them from getting the vector. So uh, you can uh, design AV vectors by transforming the capsids a little bit. And we did this using um, shuffling of the vectors, so you can take the known vectors, serotypes, and shuffle them around, and now you can get uh, a vector that is shuffled uh, but doesn't have the properties in terms of neutralizing antibodies. So here's one that we uh, have uh, developed where even though AV2 or AV8 have neutralizing antibodies across the board in our patients here, uh, they don't have it for the shuffled vector. And uh, we just got approval for uh, a uh, program to use this vector in patients with severe heart failure, and in this case, we'll be using uh, another gene called uh, inhibitor 1, which is upstream uh, of phospholamban and uh, allows the phosphorylation of phospholamban in patients. Um, 
interestingly, through our program for uh, circuit 2A, we had um, um, of gene therapy, we identified a small molecule that activates circa through simulation. So even though our program for circa activators did not work uh, 20 years ago, we now have a way of uh, inducing post-translational modification of circa in another program that really came out straight from our gene therapy work. Now, where gene therapy is going, I think, is uh, not only in, in just sort of uh, conventional heart failure, but in uh, inherited uh, cardiomyopathies. Uh, and this, these last two slides basically show the potential in the future for what gene therapy is going to look like. This is uh, a cardiomyopathy, the phospholamban R14 uh, mutation, which was initially um, identified in a Greek family, uh, but now uh, has been seen in thousands of patients, in, especially in the northern part of the Netherlands um, and also across Europe. Um, and it's even though the LV dysfunction that you see here is not terrible, uh, patients come in with ventricular arrhythmias. And using IPS from these patients, uh, we're able to correct the mutation using uh, CRISPR and Talon. And in a gene therapy approach, we were able to knock down uh, the uh, disease gene and express the gene of interest. And this is basically what, what happens. You can basically have. Uh, very, this is IPS cardiomyocytes from patients uh, with R14 mutation, uh, very arrhythmogenic, and then when you uh, fix the mutation with CRISPR, you can basically fix uh, the arrhythmias. So uh, more work is being done, as I said, in, in uh, targeting uh, uh, different sites of the EC coupling. S100A1 is another program that's coming on board, uh, hopefully soon, uh, with Patrick Most. And um, we will see, hopefully, more results in the coming years uh, based on this program. Uh, but the future of gene therapy uh, in cardiovascular diseases, I think, is based on the fact that AAV has been proven to be a safe vector. Um, effective uptake is going to be important. Modification of AV vectors is going to be uh, a new way of uh, inducing better responses. And, uh, familial cardiomyopathies and inherited cardiomyopathies are going to be the target in the future. Thank you.